As the dust settles from South Africa's emergency budget announcements, economists and ratings agencies have expressed their pessimism towards the finance minister's ability to cut expenditure and deliver on his debt stabilization plan. Joining me to unpack more on this is Mamelo Matika Nguenya, who is the chief economist at FNB, Nicola Weimar, the chief economist at Nedbank, and Murtaza Muvi, the head of financial markets at Standard Chartered Bank, and my colleague Godfrey Mutizwa is uh, joining us from CNBC headquarters in Santon. And uh, Godfrey, of course, I mean, you and I were uh, there when the um, finance minister delivered the uh, virtual budget, and we spoke to a number of uh, commentators, and the the view was the same. It wasn't too impressive, but of course, it's all about October and what is released in the medium-term budget policy statement. Absolutely, it was, Fifi, and I remember the question that I asked at the time was the credibility of the minister to deliver the cuts that he was promising, and it does turn out that there are also people who are doubting his ability. So the question I want to put to our panel is this. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen like in one gentleman, um, do you agree with me that this budget, without the cuts, does not stand? Can I start with Nikki? Cuts. Yes. Sorry, you said this budget without the without the, without the cuts that the minister is promising. Oh, an expenditure. Um, well, listen, we knew going into this budget. We've known for quite some time that we're sitting in a fairly uh, dismal fiscal situation. Uh, we went from having to accept budget deficits of over 3% of GDP, for which we, by the way, ran for over a decade, uh, to suddenly having to adjust to that 4% of GDP level. And then we were asked earlier this year to accept a 6% of GDP level. And now we seemingly over 10%. So it's not really surprising. And probably the biggest issues here is that we're not growing. So you're simply not creating the tax revenue you need. And... Um, uh, you know, that's certainly contributing to the situation we find ourselves in. And even with the cuts, I think it is going to be a challenge for them to do it. It's not easy to apply fiscal discipline. It's even harder to apply fiscal discipline in an environment where you have had weak growth for over a decade, where you have rising unemployment and you have inequality that continues to worsen. Uh, agreed, Nikki. Hard, uh, definitely. But I wonder if it is impossible, and Mutazo, just to bring you in here, uh, we did see some of the rhetoric coming out of the ratings agencies. Moody's and Fitch are the ones that come to mind, uh, saying that they're not quite confident that South Africa will be able to deliver on those spending cuts, given that our track record is not so great. We haven't been able to do it before. So what inspires confidence that we'll be able to do it now? I'm just wondering if you have heard maybe a change in, in, in tone from the the, the policymakers, particularly the, the Treasury, as to its seriousness of delivering this time around, given the fact that the recession is going to be so bad as a result of this pandemic? So thank you so much for the question. And I think I'll pick up a couple of points from Nikki, who said earlier on, I think their ability to uh, collect taxes is, is quite key. You know, the, the spending, which has been around for a decade, um, has really not... Uh, come to pan because uh, the growth ha has relatively been muted. I think it will come down to the fact that can the finance minister do enough, be it the SOEs or other reforms, which will give people, um, which right now asking questions, can the market, can, can the finance minister see through all the spending cuts that he wants to implement? Will the government have the ability to follow through on the reforms questions around supply chain. Now, the initial reaction to the speech, which I thought was somewhere in between, was quite positive for the market, both at the, at the short end of the curve and the long end. So I do think there's an undertone of, you know, the proof is in the pudding, but for now, the market, the initial reaction was positive. And if he follows through with the zero by base budgeting and the reforms he's, he's spoken about, um, Myself, I am uh, hope, hope, you know, a cautious optimistic on it, but as Nikki said, I think uh, the proof will be in the pudding and they have to really come up with these reforms they've talked about. 
Mamelo, it's pretty much the same question to you, I think. I think we're all asking the question, do we believe the minister will be able to deliver what he promised? And I want to add a little bit of meat in there. I want to ask if you think the minister and the president have got the political capital to be able to drive the cuts that are required and secondly, to be able to drive this idea around zero budgeting before we talk about the capacity of the state to be able to deliver it. Godfrey, that last point that you make is so critical. Um, so this is one of the, I would say, key consideration. Um, is the budget supported by cabinet? Um, that is key because I think we, we all understand the severity of the situation and um, the panelists um, have highlighted it quite clearly and quite well. So I think that uh, we will see over time whether this is a budget that is going to be endorsed. They do say that they are going to give us detail in the medium-term budget policy statement, and I think rating agencies will also be looking to that um, to get a sense of whether um, government is going to be able to implement um, um, the budget and work towards the active scenario as they um, pencil it um, in, in that supplementary budget. So I think the question around the zero-based uh, budgeting is really how much space does it create for the state to save money, um, given that some of the items you really um, cannot apply this methodology to, um, things like you know social grants, um, and also if you look at infrastructure spend as well. So I think that's a critical question that we need to ask um, in terms of the, uh, how much money is actually saved. And I would say also, um, you know, structural reform. I know we talk about this at length, but my question would be, you know, how far is the conversation and what are the low-hanging fruits? You know, um, in the supplementary budget, they do point to it, but with not a great deal of, of detail. And uh, the panelists also just touched on this last point that I would like to highlight is how realistic and achievable are some of the tax proposals? Um, and for me, in the absence of an improved economic activity, improved economic growth, it's hard to see how you, you collect um, taxes um, at the targets that are, that are set. And then we obviously will need to have a serious conversation about the long-term funding implications um, of this budget. And uh, part of the, the long-term uh, funding plans for this budget, of course, South Africa recognizes that we don't have the money internally ourselves. We need external help. And Nikki, just to bring you in here, because our National Treasury has been negotiating with foreign partners for around four months, I believe. And I'm, sp I'm talking specifically about the IMF uh, regarding uh, COVID-19-related aid. Uh, four months, for me, it, it really feels like a long time, but of course, I don't know how such negotiations actually um, 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 go down. I'd like your view on this, whether you think that there is a delay here, and whether you also think that this, this help potentially that we are seeking from the IMF in the form of uh, $4.2 billion, $4 billion, those are the figures that I have seen, will be the last kind of help that we seek from that institution. Well, you know, some of this is very difficult to answer. Um, you know, I think the IMF is a good option. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. They have now got um, the emergency funding that they are providing to many African countries. Attached to that, A, uh, it's at a very cheap interest rate, so that's a big plus. B, um, you know, <laughs> there is far, far reduced conditionality attached to these loans than you would normally get under IMF funding. So that's another positive for South Africa. And um, then finally, of course, from a market perspective, from an investor perspective, if you have a facility with the IMF, with that comes the assumption that there's a little bit more pressure for government to actually see through on certain structural reforms. Um, and at the same time, of course, it's also the knowledge that there is a backstop. Uh, South Africa at least has some kind of contingency in place um, if there was to be a great sort of confidence event and confidence, you know, evaporated overnight in the markets and people turned risk averse, South Africa would at least have uh, that kind of backstop available. So for those reasons, I think it's a good idea. Um, as I understand it, they are going to proceed by taking the loans uh, available from, among others, the IMF. Um, whether they would get a more longer term facility, that is not um, clear to me. And... Um, I'm not an insider to the process, so I don't have any inside information there. Um, but I assume 
uh, that it must be an option. And of all the, the, the options out there, actually, ironically, at this stage, the IMF is more open to providing funding to African countries and also to consider their debt burden than the World Bank is at the moment. The World Bank's got very conservative. So, you know, I think that the, the, the sort of 1990s view of what the IMF entailed and what IMF facilities entailed, we need to sort of let go of those biases because I don't think they apply anymore. It does seem like, you know, the, the, the delay in concluding those negotiations, of course, it does fit into the narrative of those inside the ANC who say the IMF is a bad organization and uh, is going to be seeking to impose conditionalities on South Africa. I wonder, though, if you think, uh, Nikki, and if I can bring also Mutaza in here, if you think perhaps part of the delay is because perhaps there is maybe another negotiation as well to try to add structural reform support uh, loans for uh, inside uh, those uh, negotiations. That's number one. Number two, I'm sorry to harp on back to this whole issue of whether the, uh, the government has got the support of the ANC in this. We have seen in the past few days the ANC coming and saying to the SABC, you cannot be cutting jobs. We have seen how South African Air was uh, uh, supposed business rescue program has dragged on. I am saying the political will, guys, is not there. Nikki, Mutaza? Yeah, listen, I think the labor story is going to be exceptionally difficult. Um, you, you know, you just think of the current circumstances. That's why we needed really to act on the warning signals that's been there for over a decade on SAA, on ESCOM, on Transnet, on Danau, on all of our SAA, uh, all of our state-owned enterprises. The warning signals have been there a long time. They were not making money. They were increasingly relying on state funds just to operate, to pay the interest on their debt, and obviously also to pay their salaries and wages. So. Um, Unfortunately, that's going to be one battle. The other battle is going to be with the actual um, public sector unions around just the public sector wage bill. And those cuts are absolutely essential for them to even have a shot at cutting expenditure and bringing that under, um, under control. And unfortunately, because nothing's happening on the growth front and uh, your tax revenue is compromised to the extent that it is, uh, it puts that much more pressure on you to actually achieve your expenditure cuts. So the unions are a big part of this. And then, of course, given the powerful role they play in South African politics, that means that for many people in the ANC, it might perhaps just not be tenable uh, you know, to, to deal with the sort of structural reforms that are needed because they are politically just too hard a sell. I mean, so I think that's going to be a major challenge. But they have to bear in mind that there's going to come a point where they'll have to put it very plainly to the unions, to the people within their own party, is that it is not impossible for countries to run completely out of money. That's what a sovereign debt crisis is. And either you implement those reforms yourself, you initiate them, uh, you undertake them at your pace, or ultimately, when you go begging for money, you get forced to implement them. And that's going to be a lot more hard, harder, and it's going to be a lot more painful. So that's mm -hmm. our dilemma. Mutaza? Yes, Gorpi, and I'm, I'm glad Nikki took the second part of the question first. Um, I think they will be sailing quite close to the wind because I think in order for them to get, and I don't think they have an issue around raising the capital, be it both short term and long term. I think the success of it will be how they articulate the structural reforms that get forward. And I do think be the IMF or the World Bank or the array of lenders they look at, it will not come in isolation. It has to be in, in together with the structural reform, the reforms, the reforms mm. and how they said internally will be a different battle but i do think these need to be in place and i think the balance between how much they ask for and how the debt servicing pans out is what the market is trying to do you're seeing it happen as we speak you know um the fact that it's failed them both the rand and uh, the bonds in the short term do react positive but you come into the longer end of the curve the market's asking questions and what the national treasury and uh, the finance minister need to do is answer these questions and how they can intend to finance these as they go along. 
And Mamela, just to wrap up with you, you mentioned some of the low-hanging fruits or the, the details there are that were lacking in the budget that the uh, finance minister delivered. And I'm just wondering, in your view, if the, the subsequent infrastructure symposium that was held, um, in which you know 55 bankable projects were discussed that could, could bring billions um, into the economy uh, or form part of the group of, of the low-hanging fruits, and especially against the backdrop of consumer figures that we have seen coming out of, of F&B today, showing that the consumer is on its knees and um, the consumer being in a position to lead the economic recovery right now is, is, is probably less probable than not. Mm. So I think uh, just to touch on a point that I just thought of just in terms of this consolidation story um, and whether we think government has the ability to cut expenditure. And I think it's important to note that this is for the first time where they're actually announcing an outright cut in expenditure, whereas before they've spoken about slowing down the pace of growth and expenditure. So I think that is quite key because if they're able to do it, it will certainly be uh, the, the first time. Um, so I think just in terms of, you know, these long, low hanging fruits, um, infrastructure is obviously a good catalyst for economic growth. Um, I think that if they uh, do get it right and they are able to see some of the projects through and get the necessary funding um, for those projects, I think that it will definitely add um, in terms of improving uh, the labor market, specifically if we look at, um, you know, sectors that are quite sensitive to output, so construction, manufacturing, um, and so on. So if they stick to the plan that they have anyway, we definitely think that it's going to have great multipliers in terms of um, the ability to create jobs and I think um, ultimately put some sort of income back into the consumer's um, uh, pocket. But I think in the absence of that, um, we are likely to see sort of uh, this very weak economic growth that actually started last year, worsened by the pandemic, persist uh, for the next couple of years. Well, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for your views. Uh, joining us there was Mamelo Matinkagungwenga, who is the chief economist at FNB, Nikki Weimar, the chief economist at Nedbank, and Murtazwa Mulvi, the head of financial markets at Standard Chartered Bank. And